happy Sabbath. Thank you so much uh, to the praise team. Thank you, Michael, for the scripture reading. Thank you, Elder Taylor, for the prayer. Um, today, I may keep you slightly longer than, than necessary, so forgive me. <coughs> okay. Um, his father was 22 years old when he began to reign in Jerusalem. He did that which was evil before the Lord, and he sacrificed unto all the carved images which Manasseh, his father, had set up, and he served these images. Like father, like son, they partook of the same spirit. The Bible says he was so evil that his officials in government plotted against him, and they rose up against him, and he was assassinated in his palace. The people of the land then rose up. They killed these men who had killed the king. And they dare not put anyone else different on the throne except the son of David. And they looked for this king and they found him, a young boy or a young boy at the age of eight and placed him upon his father's throne. His name was Josiah. A new dawn had arrived, and those who had maintained purity of faith began to hope that the downward trend of the kingdom was checked. For a new king, though only eight years old, feared the Lord and did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. My message for you this morning is after all this. Let us pray. Our Father, we come before thee this day. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for giving us another day. We now pray and ask that the spirit which inspired the word will now become the spirit which instructs the word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 24. Uh, that's where we're going to spend our time and a bit of chapter 35. Second Chronicles chapter 34 verse 1 to 3 I read in your hearing. The Bible says Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign and reigned in Jerusalem one and, 30, one and 30 years. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of David, his father, and declined neither to the right nor to the left. Verse 3, in the eighth, in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the Lord God of David, his father, and in the twelfth year of his reign, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from all the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. So verse 1 to verse 3 gives us an introduction to this young king, Josiah. Two points right off the bat. Number one, circumstances do not determine the state of being. But the state of being is determined by the circumstances meaning that circumstances should not define how we relate to God himself. Here was a child, eight years old, thrust to the throne of his murdered father who was wicked. But yes, the Bible tells us that as great and corrupting the circumstances are, they do not determine character. It is our choices and our decisions that determine where we go. And that's very, very important in the book, The Faith I Live By, she says, the tempter has no power to control the will or to force the soul to sin. He may distress, but he cannot contaminate. He can cause agony, but he cannot cause defilement. So therefore, again, it is our choices that we make. Despite our environment, it's the choices that we make which determines our destiny. Throughout the scriptures, one of the appellations of Jesus Christ is the lily of the valley. Now, the lily grows in different environments, but it thrives well in an environment that is stagnant where the water is still. In the valley, in some places where the water is still, where the water is slimy, where there are tadpoles and frogs, where it is yuck to see and is smelly, out of that lily, out of that valley, in those stagnant waters, comes forth a flower called forth by God and Christ says even Solomon in his beauty was not arrayed as this lily. So this lily grows out in a place that is stagnant. 
So circumstances do not determine your destiny. It is your choices. And again, Nathaniel said this at one time when Christ, when he heard that Christ came from Nazareth, what did he say? Can anything good come out of what? Out of Nazareth. So it's important. So Josiah here, we now know that because of his circumstances, he chose to follow the Lord. And this is where he leads us to. Number two, the, the scriptures are replete with young people who have done great things for God. The Bible is full of those young people. So here, this young king comes to the throne, he does great things for God. And again, the Bible is full of young people who have done great things for the Lord. A teenager sold into slavery, goes to a foreign land, rises to become who? Joseph, the prime minister of Egypt. A shepherd boy looking after his father's sheep rises to become David, a man after God's heart. A baby floating on a reed of rats in the river now rises to become what Moses, the deliverer of God's people. So again, young people have done tremendous things for God's cause. A little girl, you know, growing up with his uncle in the province of Persia rises to become Esther, the savior of God's people. So therefore, like Samuel, Josiah is called at a tender age. And now a revival and reformation began in the land. Now, only 16 years old, the work began. But first he sought the Lord, and then the reforms took place. And that's very, very important. What he did was, after seeking the Lord, the Lord then directed him to the reforms that need to take place. Very, very important. It's not the other way around. Why is this important? It is the inner ordering of the heart and of the mind which precedes the, and creates the right conditions for outward visible reform. So it is these conditions of the heart. Change starts within the heart. And then when that heart is changed, it then effects a change that can be seen outward. And I've said this many times, and I'll say it again. The most dangerous person in the world is a man out on a mission for God who does not know God. There are people out there who are deluded, and they think they know God. And these are the dangerous people in the world. How do you convince a person who is deluded, thinking that he's doing God a service? And the Bible makes it clear that a time is coming in the future when they shall kill you, thinking they're doing God a service. So therefore, the reforms begin in the heart. And then from the heart, they go outward. So therefore, verse 4 and 5, it tells us what happened here is Josiah begins these reforms. And the Bible tells us here from verse 4, And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence, and the images that were above them. He cut them down, and the groves, and the carved images, and the molten images. He broke them in pieces, and made dust of them, and he strewed it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed upon them. And the Bible says in verse 5 and 6, And he burned the bones of the priests and their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so he did in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim. So here we see this, this, this change that takes place in the kingdom. So the Bible is very clear that after seeking God, Josiah began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of all the idols and images. He broke them down. And the Bible says that he removed the images from the temple. Number two, he removed the priests that were worshipping images. Number three, he cut down the golden calf that was being worshipped. Number four, the pagan priests and sodomites. Would you believe that there were sodomites in the temple of God? Again, these were killed. So total cleansing, revival, and reformation began in the land. Now, in our Christian journey, it's very important that once we accept Christ, we need to also remove the images and idols in our lives, whatever you conceive them to be. Anything that takes priority before God becomes an idol or becomes an image that we worship. You remember when Jacob was called by God and God was telling him to go to Bethel where God had first seen him. And Jacob said to his, to his family, cleanse yourself because you're going to Bethel where God it appeared to me. And then he says, take off all your images and idols. 
And the Bible says, and they gave Jacob all their idols that were in their hands. And they took off all their earrings and they gave it to Jacob. And Jacob hid them under an oak tree in Shechem. So again, total cleansing when revival and reformation takes place. So here, like a whirlwind that sweeps everything along its path. Here, here the young king cleansed the whole kingdom because Josiah was single-minded and again understood in godly obedience and a clean sweep was made throughout all the land. Verse 8. The Bible tells us that now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the, uh, the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaleah, and Maasah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord. So the house of God now had been dilapidated, and it needed some repairs. This morning, we just uh, 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 voted in a building committee. So here, the same work needed to happen because the house of God had been dilapidated. So just like Zerubbabel and Jeshua when the exiles went back to restore the temple that had been destroyed, so under Ezra and Nehemiah, so did Josiah. The house of God which had been neglected and was in ruins and disrepair all those years through apostasy began to be renovated. Money was collected. It was given to those who were overseers. It was given to the workers. Materials were bought and the work began. So reformation in the land and now the focus on the church the sanctuary which was now being repaired. So thus, the work of God progressed. Now the Bible tells us again in verse 14, moving on quickly. It says, yes, and, and when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hekiah the priest found a book of the law given by Moses. So while the work is going on, there was a book of the law written by Moses. But because of apostasy, the book had been lost. So throughout this time, there wasn't a guide for the people. Because the book had been lost, it had been neglected. And as they were walking through the temple, removing the dust, doing the renovations, they find the book, the book of the law. And when the book was found, again, it was then taken to the king. Now, this is very important now, because the Bible tells us that all scripture is what? It's given by what? The inspiration of God. It is prophet of what? Doctrine, instruction, and in righteousness. So you tell me what was happening when they did not have this, the law. So again, you have total apostasy. So therefore, the book, which was meant to be a guide for the people, was lost sight of. And this happened in the Dark Ages, from 538 to 1798, when the papacy was ruling. The word of God was chained in monasteries. These were Dark Ages. And the Bible tells us that thy word is a what? A lamb unto my feet and a light unto my path. So if the light is taken, if the Bible is taken, what do you have? Darkness. That's why they're called the Dark Ages, because God's word was taken. God's word was chained in monasteries. And God's word was translated into Latin only. And only the priests could translate God's word. So the people were in darkness. Why? Because the word of God was taken, just like in Josiah's time. But God moved upon people like Martin Luther and all these reformers. They found the light. And when they found the light, there was a great reformation that took place. Very interesting, when Martin Luther found the word, he said all reforms must be based upon the word of God. Sola Scriptura was their platform, was their motto. All our reforms is the Bible and the Bible only. As Martin Luther then found the Bible, he began to translate the Bible from Latin into the German language, the common language. And as he did that, unbeknownst to him, he did not know that God was working. A God was working with another man called Johann Gutenberg. And he began to invent the first printing press. Unbeknownst to Martin Luther, while he was translating the Bible, God was working with another man. To, to invent this printing press. And when the Bible was filled, this printing press was already ready. And the first book to be printed on that printing press was the Bible. 
So again, God was working. So once again, the Bible was then given. You had now had the Reformation spreading, and now you had the Renaissance, and again, light spread throughout the world. So God was acting, and God was moving. So again, when the Bible was discovered, there is great light. So here they find God's word in the temple. And the Bible tells us from verse 15 what happened. It says here, And Hekiah answered and said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found a book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hekiah delivered the book unto Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book unto the king and brought the king word back, saying, All that was committed to your servants, they have done it. And they've gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord, and they delivered it unto the overseers and unto the hand of the workmen. Verse 18, Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard of the law, he rent his clothes. Can you imagine? All this time, there was no moral instruction. At this time, there was no guide. There was no foundation. So when the king hears this, the word of God is like a dagger to his heart. And the Bible says that he then you know, rose up. He then tore his clothes because, again, he knew that the word of God had to be the foundation of the government. And the Bible tells us that immediately the king sent word to a prophetess, a lady prophet called Hulda, to find out what is to happen to the nation based upon what he has read. And the word of God was, go and tell the king, it is too late. Judgment was coming. It was inevitable. They had been weighed on the balances of God, and they were found wanting. So this was the word of God which came to the nation of Judah. So here the word of God says, go and tell him that judgment was coming. But at the same time, verse 26 to verse 28, you hear the most wonderful words given by God to this young king. And the Bible says here, and as for the king of Judah, who, who, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so shall you say unto him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the words thou hast heard. Because your heart was tender, because you humbled yourself before God when you heard the words against this place, and because of the inhabitants thereof, and you humbled thyself before me, and didst rain thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, says the Lord. Behold, I will gather thee up to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered unto thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought word unto the king. Very important. The Bible is very clear that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken spirit and a contrite heart, O oh Lord, thou will not despise. So here the king humbled himself and God says, because you humbled yourself, I will protect you. None of these things will come upon you. You will not see the destruction that shall take place in the land. The same promise was given, if you remember, to Abimelech, the Ethiopian. After rescuing Jeremiah from the pit, God said to him, because thou have been faithful, I will protect you. No harm will come upon you because you did put your trust in me. So God here gives Josiah a promise. That because you humbled yourself, when you heard the words, I will protect you from harm and you shall go in peace. Josiah's last act was to restore true worship. He proclaimed God's word before the people. He committed himself to keeping the commandments of God. He required all the people to follow his example of obedience because righteousness exalts a nation. And finally, Josiah instituted the Passover. Okay, a Passover feast which the Bible describes. And the Bible says here in Second Chronicles chapter 35, verse 18, the next chapter, it says, And there was no Passover like that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet, neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover. What a legacy of Josiah. Young king, tremendous legacy, tremendous revival, reformation. And because of Josiah's reforms that he did, three Hebrew boys would stand in the furnace one day. 
because of Josiah's reforms, Daniel will stand in the lion's den. So all these were standing on a foundation laid by Josiah. What a legacy. But I wish I could stop here. I wish I could finish and stop here, but I, but I can't. Let me explain what was happening at this particular time. I'll give you some um, the geopolitics of that uh, area. In the middle here, you've got Assyria, a mighty empire, cruel, strong. Down there, you've got Egypt, a superpower which is rising, but a superpower. Here, you've got Babylon, and here you've got Middle Persia. Now, all these nations are vying for positions of power, but Assyria is the known superpower. Now, from Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, who is the father of Nebuchadnezzar, rises and goes and attacks this major empire, Assyria. The attack is so vicious, they come close to the capital city called Asher, that the king panics and he sends out a request for help from the Egyptians. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's father then makes a siege. Together with the Medes, they then come the second time, they attack the city of Asher, and the city of Asher falls, and the king of Assyria then escapes from Asher, he goes to Nineveh, another capital city, where Jonah was sent. So after sending help to Egypt for help, in Egypt there is an older king, his name is Samaticus. So he does not send help, he hears the call for help, but he does not send his army. The Babylonians then pursue the Assyrians. They come to Nineveh, and after about two years, Nineveh falls. The king is killed. And the crown prince, who is from Assyria, escapes with his army. And the second time, they send help to Egypt. Help us from these Babylonians, from these Medes and Scythians. So again, help does not come. So they escape from Nineveh, and they go to Haran. Haran is where Abraham dwelt, and Lot, and uh, Terah, his father. And then again, they dwelt there. Again, the Babylonians pursue, and they go to, to Haran. And again, Haran falls after a three-year siege as well. And they call again to Egypt, down there for help. And finally, at this particular time, there is a young king in Egypt called Nico. Nico hears the call, and again he begins to march with his army going towards um, Assyria to help the Assyrians. So the Assyrians then escape to a town called Carchemish, which is in the Euphrates. So they are waiting for the Egyptians to come and help them fight the Babylonians. Now the Bible tells us, let's go back into our scripture, let's go to chapter 35 of 2 Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 35, and we read, verse 20. Second Chronicles chapter 35, verse 20. And the Bible says, after all this. This is the title of my sermon this afternoon, after all this. After what? After all this that Josiah had done, after all the reforms that Josiah had done, after the reformation that Josiah had done, after following God obediently as Josiah did, after having the Passover as Josiah did, after all this, the Bible tells us here in, um, in the next verse, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Nico, king of Egypt, came to fight against Carchemish by the Euphrates, and Josiah went to meet him. So Nico has been called by God. He had been given this call, and you shall discover God had sent him to go and help the Assyrians in Carchemish. Because the Assyrians are asking for help because the Babylonians are destroying the empire because the empire was almost falling apart. So the Bible says that after all this, Nico, king of Egypt, um, went against Carchemish by the Euphrates, and Josiah went to meet him. But Nico sent ambassadors to him, to Josiah, the young king, saying, 
What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God has commanded me to make haste, forbear from meddling with God who is with me, lest he destroy you. Pharaoh says to Josiah, this is none of your business. This is not your war. You do not have a dog in this fight. Don't meddle with God's business. I have not come to attack you, but I'm passing to meet the um, Assyrians who have called for my help. So this is nothing to do with you. I have not come against you this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. God told me to hurry, stop interfering, stop meddling with, with God who is with me or else he will destroy you. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 17, it says, getting involved in an argument that is none of your business is like going down the street and grabbing a dog by its ears. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 17. It's none of your business. So Josiah goes, and the Bible tells us first, verse 22. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him but disguised himself that he might fight with him and hearkened not unto the words of Nico from who? From the mouth of who? Of God. And he came to fight with him in the valley of Megiddo. And the archers shot at King Josiah and the king said unto his servants, have me away for I am so wounded. And his servants took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot and uh, that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died. Young king died. After all this, after having begun a good race, is this the way to die, Josiah? And the question is, why God? Why did you do this? Why? Couldn't you just have protected Josiah like what you did to Jehoshaphat? Why did he have to die? I'm sure other people also survived that battle, but why did Josiah have to die? And in here is a warning for all of us, a warning for me, a warning for you. And three warnings I'm going to give as I uh, get ready to land. Uh, three warnings. The first one is, God can speak to anyone. He does not need your permission. God spoke to Abimelech in the Bible, who was a pagan king. God spoke to Laban in a dream, you remember? Yes, okay. And also, God spoke to Balaam through a donkey. God spoke to Pilate's wife in a dream. This morning, we read that God spoke to Cornelius, the Italian. You remember, the Jews were saying, well, he went into the house of a Gentile. Yeah, and Peter says, well, I went there, I was sent by God because God spoke to him. So God can speak to anybody. And he does not need your permission. There's a, 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 a song from a, a writer called Daryl Coley, D-A-R-Y-L Coley. And he's got a song called Sovereign. And he says here, Sovereign, Sovereign and says, the Lord my God is sovereign. And then he says, he can do whatever he wants to do. And then he says, he can do whatever he wants to do when he wants to. And then he says, God can do whatever he wants to do how he wants to, because God is sovereign. God is God. And then he says, who am I to question his wisdom? The refrain says, I am nothing. Who am I to question God's judgment? He says, I am nothing. Who am I to be offended by what he allows to be? I must realize that God is sovereign. So Josiah needed to know that God is sovereign. So question number two, point number two, lesson number two. Do not as presume you know God so much that you do not inquire of his will. 
Josiah may have had good intentions. I don't know what his intentions are. The Bible is not very clear. But we know that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So no matter what his intentions were, but again, if there were, if there were wrong intentions, there were wrong intentions. So again, Josiah may have a good intention. But again, the Bible tells us that, again, he did not wait to find out what God's will is. I'm going to read to you manuscript releases, uh, two quotations from the prophet, and she's quoting on this particular incident, and this is what she says. Because Josiah died in battle, who would charge God with denying his word that Josiah would go down in peace? The Lord did not give orders for Josiah to make war on the king of Egypt. When the Lord gave the king of Egypt orders that the time he had come to serve him by warfare, and the ambassadors told Josiah not to make war with Nico, no doubt Josiah congratulated himself that no word had come from the Lord to him directly. How can God speak to Pharaoh and not speak to me? God is supposed to speak to me, and then I speak to Pharaoh. So he's saying that God had not spoken to him directly. So for Josiah to turn back with his army would have been humiliating. So he went on. And because of this, he was killed in battle. A battle that he should have had nothing to do with. The man who had been so greatly honored by God did not honor the word of the Lord. The Lord had spoken in his favor, predicted good things for him, and Josiah became self-confident and failed to heed the warning. He went against the word of God, choosing to follow his own way, and God could not shield him from the consequences of his act. Third point, no one is indispensable. Do not think we are so important to God that God needs us more than, than we need him. Because the work of God will still go on. You remember the other time we were talking about how the work of God was passed from Moses to, to Joshua. Yeah, when, when, you know, there was no prophet like Moses whom God spoke face to face, the Bible says. And when he was buried, God buried him. And when Moses died, they mourned for him 40 days. No prophet like Moses. And then the Bible says, then God chose Joshua. And God said, as I was with Moses, so I will be with, with you. So the work of God goes on. So no one is so important to God that they think that God needs them more than they need God. So this is very important. Again, I'm going to read to you from the Smitten Rock. Uh, you find this in Patrick's and Prophets, um, and I'm going to read what the prophet says again concerning the Smitten Rock. As you know, when they came to the place where the water was needed, there was a rock, and God said to Moses and Aaron, go and what? Speak to the rock. But because of the pressure of the people, because of, you know, how it is with the people, then Moses, remember, said, listen, you what? Rebels! Must we fetch water out of the rock? And through anger, Moses took the stick, the rod, and struck the rock. Water came out, but he had disobeyed. And this is what she says there in Patriarchs and Prophets. Not even the integrity and faithfulness of Moses could avert the retribution because of that fault. God had forgiven the people greater transgressions, but he could not deal with sin in the leaders as those who are led. To whom much is given, much is required. Okay, he had honored Moses above every man upon the earth. He had revealed to Moses his glory, and through him he communicated his statue to Israel. The fact that Moses enjoyed so great light and knowledge made his sin more grievous. And then she says, Past faithfulness will not atone for one wrong act. The greater the light and privileges the greater granted to man, the greater is his responsibility, and the more aggravated is his failure, and the heavier his punishment. Now, as I come to the ready land, I'm now landing now. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. Is there hope for Josiah? What do you think? Yes. Yep, yep. And I know Elder talked about trajectory. You always talk about trajectory. That's very important. Is there hope for Josiah? He died in disobedience. He went against God. Is there hope for Josiah? Josiah was the son of David, as you know. Jesus 
He's also a son of of David, because he's called the son of David. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I present to you the two sons of David, Josiah and Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Josiah sought the Lord with all his heart. And Jesus did all, did all the will of his father with his heart. Josiah found the book of the law. Jesus gave us the law on Mount Sinai. Josiah cleansed the temple. Jesus cleansed the temple twice, as you know. Josiah instituted the priesthood in Judah. Jesus instituted the priesthood of all believers. We are a royal nation of priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Josiah died in the prime of his life. Jesus died in the prime of his life. Here's the difference. Josiah died a sinner. Jesus died sinless. Is there hope for Josiah? Is there hope for you and me? Yes, there is. Why? Again, Josiah died a sinner, but Jesus died a savior. And because Jesus died a savior, there is hope for Josiah. Because Jesus, the son of David, died as a savior, Josiah, the other son of David, can have hope. Because Jesus died as savior, Sam McQueen can have hope. Because Jesus died as a savior, Monica Broadbent will have hope. Because Jesus died as savior. Because he died as savior, Wilson Church can have hope. There was a fishing village in Scotland. Um, and on the shore one day, there was a ship. Just, just after the shore, there was a ship which had been caught in the storm. And the ship had run aground, and the storm was so fierce, the ship was falling apart. From the shore, a rescue mission was arranged and some men set out to go and save those men who were in that ship which was falling apart. And as they went through the storm, up they went to the craves and down they went. And finally, after a long time, they reached the ship and were able to rescue everybody except one person. Because the, that person could have put more weight in the boat and they would have drowned. So they came back after some time. They came back to the shore having rescued all these men from the boat except one. So then the leader who was leading this rescue effort says, the men who went out to rescue these people cannot go because they are so tired and exhausted. So we need volunteers to go and rescue the one man that is left on the ship. So people, there's a discussion, and there was a young boy who came out. He says, I will go. A young boy fit, he says, I will go, and I will volunteer to go and rescue that man. And the other people, men as well, came in and joined in, and they were ready to go. But before they went, a little old lady came in with the gray hair and put her hands on that little boy, uh, John, the young man. And he says, John, don't go. Please don't go. You're all, you're all I have. Years ago, your father went out into the sea, died in the sea, and never came back. Last year, your brother William went out into the sea and he died in the sea and never came back. So don't go, you're all I have. And John took his, he, her mother's, his mother's hands off his shoulder and says, Mom, I have to go. If I don't go, that man will die. Eventually, they jumped in the boat and they sailed again into the darkness, almost like a suicide mission. They went and obviously it was now dark. And after what seemed like a hundred years, somebody from the shore could see some movement in the water and they could see the form of a boat. And um, as they were getting closer, you know, somebody shouted, John, John, have you saved the man? Have you saved him? And John says, yes, we have saved the man. And please tell my dear old mother, it is Brother William. 
brother saving brother. The mom was trying to stop her son from going out to save the other son whom she thought was dead. Our loving Father, we come before thee this day. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Once again, we thank you for your word that because Jesus died a savior, we can have hope. And we, as children of Abraham, we belong to thee. We thank you for the hope we have in scriptures. And the Bible tells us the base of us have feet of clay. That Josiah, even though he did a lot of things for you, he is only human. And again, all of us can falter. But we want to thank you that Jesus Christ, the other son of David, because he died, Josiah and Wilson and those watching online can have hope. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.